Well, welcome. Uh, welcome to those in the auditorium and those that are also joining us on Zoom, as I mentioned earlier, and to our regulars who are listening and watching from across Australia, um, and to also to our first-time listeners, uh, whether you're in Australia, in India, in the USA, in Germany, in Indonesia, in the Philippines, um, or across Europe, wherever or whenever you may be listening to this, um, then you need to know that you are welcome here. Today we begin a brand new series called Questioning Jesus and the Search for Answers. And over the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at various questions and delve into different stories from the life of Jesus. Hopefully, these questions will encourage us to think deeply and engage well with our loving Creator God. What's your hope for 2024? We've just marked the change of year from 2023 to 2024. And how are we different at the end of 2023 to what we were at the start of that year? What are your hopes for 2024? Let me take a moment to pray. Jesus, as we open your word, we want to be open to you today. We want to respond to the things that you say to us today. May we hear clearly from you. Holy Spirit, would you speak to us deep to deep? And may you enlist in us a response, a desire to go deeper with you in this year that we're embarking on. Amen. A question, an utterance. It's meant to elicit an answer or discussion or to have us reflect on something. To go on a quest of seeking, to inquire, to discover afresh. Questions help us to delve deeper and to discover more. Just over 30 years ago, when I was selling mobile phones, I discovered how important it was to ask a customer good questions. Rather than immediately showing them the display rack with all the different phones and, and trying to sell them on the latest features of any particular phone, I found it was better to ask. So tell me, tell me about the phone that you currently own. What's it like? What works for you? What doesn't? And as I listened to the customer, I learned more from them. I learned how they used the phone, why they had one, what they liked about it, what they didn't like about it, their bugbears, what they really appreciated about the features of their phone. And all the while, while they listened, I tucked that information away. And then at an appropriate time when I said, so I'm needing a new phone for this reason, then I'd be able to talk to them and address the particular way that this new phone would meet their needs. The rapport built was um, best shown when a returning customer uh, rang me up to say that they needed a new phone, they were in a hurry, and that uh, they wanted me to pick out one for them on their behalf and have it ready, connected for when they arrived in the store. Over the years, through mentoring and supervision of others, I've discovered how important it is to collect questions and ask good questions. Asking good questions can help to shape and even change one's life. It's interesting that in the account of uh, John's account of the life of Jesus, the first words that John records from Jesus is a question. And in fact, the last words that John records of Jesus in the Gospel of John is a question. If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? If you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn to the start of John's account of the life of Jesus. So if you go to Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, we're going to be looking at John. And we pick up John's account with a different John, John the baptizer. To give you a bit more of a context, I'll start reading from John 1.29, and the previous verse talks about Bethany. Now, this is a different Bethany to the Bethany where Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived. That was just, just east of Jerusalem. This Bethany is on the other side of the Jordan. The Bethany where John baptised was in another location. John had baptised Jesus and Jesus then went into the wilderness for about 40 days. And on Jesus' return, we pick up the account in John 
1, 29. And a series of next days, and then the next day, and the next day. John 1, 29 says this. The next day, John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is the one I was talking about when I said, A man is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. I did not recognise him as the Messiah, but I have been baptising in water so that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descend like a dove from heaven and resting upon him. I didn't know that he was the one, but when God sent me to baptise with water, he told me, the one on whom you see the Holy the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptise with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen to Jesus, so I testify that he is the chosen one of God. The next day, the following day, John was again standing with two of his disciples. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, Look, there is the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Jesus looked around and saw them following. What do you want? he asked them. They replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and see, he said. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon when they went with him to the place where he was staying and they remained with him for the rest of the day. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of these men who heard what John said and then followed Jesus. Andrew went to find his brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. Then Andrew brought Simon to meet Jesus. Looking intently at Simon, Jesus said, Your name is Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which means Peter. Now, there's a lot happening here, and we could take actually a couple of months just to unpack these few verses. And before we delve into the question that Jesus asks, it's worthwhile giving some significance to the terms rabbi and disciple, the words that we don't tend to use that much or we we have a limited understanding of. Now, a rabbi is an outstanding, a, a person who has been seen as having outstanding knowledge of the Torah and its interpretation. And as they're a budding, wanting to be rabbi, they're tested and they, they have to pass a number of tests and they had to be of good standing in the community. And then, when it was time and they'd passed all these tests, three other rabbis who had been through the process themselves and looked at this person and said, you've got what it takes. They would, as it were, ordain or set apart this new rabbi. Um, They would lay hands on the rabbi, pronounce their blessing on them, and the candidate then became a rabbi. A disciple would be a student of the rabbi. More than learning from a lecturer and a teacher today where you would just sit and and listen to the lecture and that sort of stuff and go on and, and kind of decide whether you wanted to apply it or not, the student or the disciple would learn and to seek to imitate the rabbi's life from what he ate, the way he ate, the way he walked, how he dressed, all the way through to what he taught. The disciple would fund the life of the rabbi. Probably the best example of understanding how well regarded and how tight this relationship is between a disciple and a rabbi is best captured in the, um, the Mishnah Bav, uh, Bava Metzia in chapter 2, verse 11, where I'll summarise it. You can uh, read it more fully on the screen. But to summarise, it says, if you were searching for the lost property of both your father and your rabbi, your rabbi's loss takes precedence over that of your father. Since your father only brought you into the world, whereas your teacher has taught you wisdom, the Torah, and brought you into the world to come. But if your father is also like a rabbi, then dad wins out. If your father and your rabbi are in captivity, 
You must first ransom, you must first redeem, you must first rescue the rabbi. And only afterwards, if you can, your father. Unless, once again, your father himself is a rabbi. And then you must first ransom your father. That is a significant relationship, isn't it? So having a rabbi and being a rabbi's disciple is a big deal. Now, John the baptizer has two of his disciples. He's a rabbi and he has two of his disciples with him. Andrew and quite possibly John the writer of this gospel. Can't be sure it's John, but it could well be. But for now, we're just going to call him Anon. So on this particular day, we have John the baptizer and his two disciples, Andrew and Anon, who have been dedicating themselves to learn from John. And John intentionally directs them to Jesus. Jesus is walking by, minding his own business, and then suddenly he has these two men following him. Jesus realises that he has these two lads following him, and Jesus has probably seen them before with John, lapping up everything that John had said and did. And now John has, he's back down the road, and Andrew and Anon are following Jesus. What do you want? Jesus asked them. The first words that we hear from Jesus in John's gospel are, what do you want? On the surface, it can seem like such a simple question. What do you want? Me? I want a hot chip sandwich with butter lavished on that melts and moulds into that soft white bread and you just munch on that and, oh, happy days. What do you want? I've got you all hungry now, or maybe repulsed, I don't know. Um, What do you want? A new car, a place to live. What do you want can be as shallow or as deep as you want to go. As Jesus walked by, John looked at him and declared, Look, the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples heard this, they followed Jesus. Jesus looked around and saw them following. What do you want? He asked them. Today, at the start of 2024, we're now seven days into a new year. And Jesus wants to ask, if Jesus, and if Jesus was to ask you the question, what do you want? How might you answer? You see, asking such a question, question can and should profoundly impact the rest of the year, perhaps even the rest of our life. What do you want? Wayne Cordero tells a story of a rabbi living centuries ago. Disappointed by his lack of direction with life's purpose, he was wandering this chilly evening. With his hands firmly thrust in his pockets, he aimlessly walked through the empty streets, questioning his faith in God, the scriptures and his call to ministry. The only thing colder than the winter air was the chill that he felt in his own soul. He felt so enshrouded by his own despair that he mistakenly walked into a military compound off limits to civilians. The bark of the soldier um, shattered the silence of the evening chill. Who are you and what are you doing here? Excuse me, the rabbi replied. I said, who are you and what are you doing here? After a brief moment, the rabbi, in a gracious tone, so as not to provoke the soldier, said, how much do you get paid every day? What does that have to do with you? Well, with some delight in making a new discovery, the rabbi said, I will pay you you the equal sum if you will ask me those same two questions every day. Who are you? What are you doing here? What do you want? Jesus didn't ask this question once. It's actually recorded that he asked this several times throughout his three years of ministry. And it's probably helpful that we allow Jesus to ask us this question. You see, who asks the question also shapes our understanding of the question. If a shop assistant asks you, 
what do you want, then who they are shapes the intent of the question and the depth of your answer. Jesus here has been identified by John the baptizer as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is the one I was talking about when I said, a man is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. The one who will baptise with the Holy Spirit, the chosen one of God. This Jesus, this Jesus is asking you, what do you want? Jesus is looking into your eyes, the windows of your soul. Jesus is asking you, what do you want? It's a question that eclipses any New Year's resolution, like losing the Christmas kilos or as some sort of um, shopping list to Santa. This is a deep question that can change the direction of your life and your priorities. It can affect what we say yes to and also what we say no to. What do you want? It speaks to your longings that will shape your choices. What do you want? Andrew and Anon stopped dead in Jesus' tracks. Jesus has asked them this question, and how will they answer? Jesus, John reckons that you're the pre-existing chosen one that baptises with the Holy Spirit. Is that true? Or, or maybe it's, hey, Jesus, we've got a game of lot casting happening later tonight and we're down a player. Will you come and join our team? No. One looked at the other and finally they replied, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come and see, he said. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon and they went with him to the place where he was staying and they remained with him the rest of the day. Where are you staying has an embedded meaning in the request. They've acknowledged him as master, as teacher, as rabbi. But where are you staying goes further than a location for sleeping. We want to be like you is inherent in the response. We want to see and know if what John says about you is true. We want to become your followers and allow your life to shape and transform every aspect of our life. Andrew and Anon want to spend time with Jesus, to enter into a relationship with Jesus, to explore what it means to have faith in Jesus. And as they do, and based on both John the Baptist's testimony and their personal experiences, they quickly come to believe that Jesus is indeed the chosen one of God. And while not fully developed in their understanding of Jesus, and their understanding of Jesus as Messiah, Christ and Saviour, there's the beginnings of it there. And it would be challenged and reorientated. It would go deeper. It would get stronger. Their response to what do you want question, would go on to shape their life and define their death. So today, Jesus comes to you and asks you, what do you want? Perhaps you've been um, evaluating your life. You've been looking for significance and meaning. You've been longing for love and to be loved. Your life's been going okay, but there's, there's just something else. You can't put your finger on it, but you wonder whether this Jesus stuff could be true. Jesus asks you, what do you want? The challenge with answering the what do you want question, especially around matters of faith, is akin to slow cooker faith versus a microwave world full of spirituality. Quick fixes 
and sugar rush spirituality are a dime a dozen. But Andrew and Anon recognise that deep, abiding, life-changing faith is not some form of a speed date. It means staying with Jesus and getting to know him personally. Not a second-hand spirituality or hand-me-down religion. What do you want? For those of you who have been following Jesus for some time, perhaps direction, clarity or commitment has been lost because of the busyness and the noise of life. Jesus asks you today, what do you want? How might you answer Jesus? What are your hopes, your longings, not just for 2024? Jesus asks you, what do you want? Let me pray. Jesus, as we take time to sit and absorb that question, as you look into our eyes, as you gaze deeply into our soul. You want to to engage with us. You ask us a question and it's not a rhetorical one. You're looking for an answer from us. What do we want? Holy Spirit, would you brood in us? Would you move in us? Would you help us to have clarity to to gain understanding about what it is that we want that we might respond to Jesus with the request from our life Amen Well today my encouragement is during this process is to take some time to respond take some time to write down your answer to Jesus' question. If it is to know who Jesus is, to see if he is who he claims he is, if he's worthy to, to follow, be following, uh, for you to follow Jesus for the rest of your life, then mark that down and I would love the opportunity to chat to you some more about what it means to follow Jesus, what it means to spend time to get to know him. For those of you who have been a disciple of Jesus for a while, I believe Jesus wants to uh, refresh that question with you. What do you want? So as some music's play, I encourage you to respond with those cards. For those at home, with the, um, the chat function, for those that listening, love to hear from you as well. You can contact us through the website. What do you want? Let's spend some time with God.